All right. And here we go. And welcome. Ah, I always love watching that participant number thing go do, 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 like that. Good morning, everybody, as you're coming in. I hope that you are all doing um, fabulously well this Thursday morning. Um, it's actually here in San Francisco a bit cool. Uh, the wind is not like the Mistral, but nevertheless, it's not exactly what I would expect in the so called Indian summer here in the Bay Area when we're used to. Uh, getting um, a little warm weather. I hope things are well where you are. Um, I am uh, compassionate and hoping nothing but positive juju for those of you in uh, the southern part of our state down, particularly by Santa Barbara, where you got fires raging and Highway 101 closed, nothing but positive juju your way. And for those of you who are um, coming in and joining us from various parts uh, outside of uh, the state of California or other parts of California or even other parts of the world. Uh, I know we obviously have uh, not only our, some of our panelists here from Europe and specifically from France, but um, we, I know for a fact, always have people buzzing in from different, um, different places. So thank you all for being with us today. Uh, bienvenue, as they would say in France or uh, Bon après-midi, bonjour, bonsoir peut-être, uh, depending on where you are timing-wise. I'm going to give everybody just a moment or two um, to, uh, to join in, get our numbers a little bit more as expectation, and then we will hop into our program of uh, Color Me Roan. I have to say that this oh, is... Oh, I see Tim! Ooh, you're echoing, Lee Mang, I think. Oh, that's right. I'm good now. Okay. Uh, Tim, who wasn't able to make Monday, I'm so glad that he's here today. That's great, too. That's great. Also, Welcome. Tim, glad you're feeling better. Um, we missed you for Loire, but you're glad to hear that you're joining us for uh, the Van Duron. And um, yeah, this is, should be an exciting, uh, exciting program. Roan's a pretty special spot near and dear to um, certainly myself, my team. Sarah, I know you. You actually, as I'll reiterate later, live part-time in the Rhone Valley, having an abode in Avignon and being far more conversant in it, um, certainly than I am, if you spent like a good chunk of your life there. And um, it's also a, a treat to do Rome because um, needless to say, um, we're all fans of the wines as certainly our producer friends are because that's their livelihood. But I, I um, hearken back to a statement I made last year when we did a Rome session, which is that for those of you who are uh, familiar with American television, specific uh, American comedies, you will of course remember fondly the show, Everybody Loves Raymond. Well, in my household, it's everybody loves Roan uh, because I don't know anybody um, who, when you say Roan wines or name a specific Roan wine, they don't immediately break out into a Cheshire cat grin. I'm so excited to be trying the wine. So with that said, um, we're going to go ahead and kickstart our program today. Um, I'm going to go through the proverbial um, housekeeping stuff first. And my screen is, of course, frozen again. Oh, there we go. Sometimes you just have to keep hitting. Anyway, um, just a little bit of basics before we get started. Standard operating procedure for BevCon and for uh, Master the World accompanied sessions. Uh, please, please, please open and pour your wines out um, if you haven't done so already. They are scrunched up there in those little 187 ml bottles and any oxygen you can give them will make them happy campers. Um, if you want to do this tasting blind, leave the sleeves on. And don't peel to reveal if you are um, not wanting to do that and wanting to know what everything is before you jump into the glass, before we tell you what's in the glass. Um, needless to say, you can peel off those pressure sensitive stickers. Uh, Q&A will be answered as we always do. Um, Li Nang and, and Andrea and team will be monitoring all of that and we'll have a dedicated Q&A period a little bit later on. And um, uh, that will be facilitated by Li Meng and thrown out to all the appropriate folks. Uh, for those of you who are interested in chatting but not asking a question, you can do so uh, in the chat feature. And that will be uh, for hellos, virtual hugs, all of that. Please do select everyone to share your comments. If you do not do that, only myself, Sarah, and a few other people will get to see it. And while we're happy to do it, we uh, see it. We're sure that you want to send that to everybody out there. Uh, tomorrow morning, a recording of this session, as all other sessions, will be available by the bit.ly link that um, accompanies it, as well as um, uh, the link for, for um, book the booklet, the amazing booklet that uh, you have that Sarah will talk to us about a little bit later, and all sorts of other goodies. And please, please, please uh, complete your uh, survey. Feedback is crucial for us 
And most importantly for our sponsors, these programs do not happen without the generosity um, of our sponsors. So uh, you can also note the wines that you're interested in getting more information about later on. The survey is at that link, bit.ly slash eval, uh, but that will also come to you again um, with, the, with the stuff tomorrow morning as well as stuff at the end of the day. Boy, that's a lot of housekeeping for one slide, wouldn't you say, Sarah? Um, <laughs> just again, for Master of the World, for those of you who are familiar with this, uh, this will be not news, but for those of you who are newbies on the mt.twwines.com track, one of the cool things you can do is if you are working on your tasting skills, you don't actually have to wait till the day of the program. For future kits, you can get a jump start by logging on to mtwwines.com punching in the name of the kit after you've registered and done that and selecting um, one of our three Pelotons. You can either do the full workout and go up and down uh, the mountains and uh, around the uh, river and all that other stuff. You can do quick picks just to pick grapes and regions, or you can just say, show me by just hitting reveal. Uh, everything will jump up there. If you're really competitive and want to do this with your friends, leaderboard is XO8L. And um, again, when you do hit the reveal, whether at the end of the evaluation or simply by hitting reveal wine profiles at the beginning, you'll get a lot of good, useful information about the wines and comparatives about the regions, the grapes, and all of that other good stuff that will echo much of what we're talking about today. The only other thing I would say before we jump in is please, please, please taste at your leisure. Jump into the glasses, taste anything you want, whenever you want, um, because I know that if you're drinking your wine, you'll be socially happy and well uh, prepped for our session. Do note that when Sarah and I and our panelists um, decide we want to speak about a specific wine, we will let you know and then obviously pick up the appropriate glass. Um, at that time, we will go one through six for those of you who are doing it blind. And if you're not doing it blind, we'll tell you what you already know. All right. So that said, um, uh, just a quick, you'll see these folks later on, but just so you recognize them when they do pop on the screen, we are uh, fortunate to be joined by several um, of our panelists today uh, from France. Uh, we have um, Florence Kio from her uh, family's estate. We have uh, Clément uh, from Ronea. Uh, Patrick is playing a stunt double for a French person today as he represents uh, our mutually good friend, uh, family friends, the Gigals. And then Kate uh, will be joining us from Domaine du Marchand a little bit later on. However, before we actually kickstart this um, and uh, to, to sort of lead us off and give you the official bienvenue from the heart of the, the Rhone uh, Valley and speaking for the folks at Enterone, I'd love to ask um, Daphne Payon uh, to join us. Daphne is with Enterone. She is um, the person I work with day to day, is an absolute advocate for the Rhone and an ambassador for the Rhone and a great person to work with, one of the most organized folks I happen to know, wine-wise or not. So Daphne, <laughs> if you'd love to say a few introductory words, we'd love to hear from you. Okay. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Evan. <laughs> Uh, bonjour everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to our webinar on behalf of the vine growers, the wineries, and the negociants of the Côte de Rhône. Um, if you're not familiar with Antaron, um, they are the one printing this amazing booklet. Um, please hold on to it. It may be a collector as uh, they may not be printed again. But just uh, digitally available. Um, Antaron does many other things, uh, economic and technical support for the wineries and the vine growers, uh, education, communication, and events towards the trade and the, um, and the consumers as well. Uh, this webinar today is an illustration of... Um, oops, sorry, I'm not muted. I thought you were just coming to us in stereo, Daphne. <laughs> now you're muted. Now we can't hear you at all. All right. So I think the, uh, sorry, the webinar is an illustration of the diversity of the uh, Cote de um, production, uh, red, rosé, and white. And uh, we hope it will also show the, uh, illustrate the growing interest in white and rosé from the region. And before diving in the webinar, I wanted to share some news from the vineyards. Um, the harvest is finished in most places. It is, it is a smaller harvest because of the frost um, that hit us badly uh, in April. But the first cuvées are 
doing very well and show a, a beautiful tannic structure, which is promising for, for, the, for the coming vintage. Um, another good news, uh, more on the event side of things, uh, Interon will host its uh, découverte en Valley du Rhône next year after uh, three years of uh, IOTA uh, because of COVID. So touching wood, uh, it happens. Uh, it will be in April. Uh, it will start in Avignon for two days and then moves north in Tain Hermitage and, um, and en Puy. Uh, we expect about 600 producers and uh, wineries exhibiting, 40% of which are certified um, organic and biodynamic which says quite a bit about the, the current trend we're seeing in, uh, in Holzer Rhone Valley. Um, so we hope you can join us. It's, uh, it's truly a movable feast and uh, you can meet like countless of uh, winemakers. Uh, and to conclude, thank you um, to, to everyone for attending. Uh, thank you to our super hosts. And uh, thank you especially to uh, the Rhone winemakers who are staying late in the office to be with us. So thank you and uh, back to you, Evan. Thank you, Daphne. We appreciate that. And uh, thank you again for your support and for, um, for, for joining us. So on that note, um, I'm going to say, here we go, on y va. And let's um, kick off with just some, uh, some color by numbers first. So uh, just some general uh, statistics that you can do, as Daphne mentioned, um, the booklet that many of you um, who have kits, you all got one in your book. For those of you who either lost it, gave it to a friend and didn't get it back, or simply are with us today without wine, which we are delighted to have you here. There's great learning, even if you don't have the wines with you. Um, there will be a link um, when we send out the recording tomorrow, which will allow you to download the e-version of the book, which it sounds like we'll need to do in the future because it doesn't sound like they're gonna print the hard copies again. I was reading that cryptically, Sarah. I don't know about you, but that's what I got. <laughs> I'm holding so. on to mine now. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit by numbers. Um, uh, as you can see on the screen there, um, it's obviously a red focused area with uh, three quarters of the wine being red. If you spent time there on the back half of the year as we get into harvest and such, obviously it's a red part of the world. 15% uh, rosé, 10% of, of white. The rosé numbers are interestingly quite stable. There's other parts of uh, France where the rosé numbers have crept up over time and the white numbers have dropped simply by virtue of the rosé revolution that is going on out there um, led by Provence, but nevertheless there. They've always produced a good amount of rosé in that part of the world and obviously a, a smaller amount of white. Um, a good chunk of acreage there, um, 116,000 plus acres, which equals less, just slightly less than 10% of all French vineyards and covers off on five uh, of the greater department in the area. It's the second largest AOC by volume and acreage. And um, as uh, Daphne mentioned um, recently, 10% currently certified, and that's going up. And that equals literally almost a third of uh, all of Southeast France's organic total. 418 different communes, 31 appellations, 17 crews, uh, split between the north and the south with uh, slightly more in the, um, in, in the south in terms of production. And then uh, 23 grape varietals uh, that you can find there of which 22 are used in the Appellation wines. Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you, but before I officially turn over the microphone or the baton, just for those of you who don't know Sarah, uh, Sarah is a friend um, of mine, a fellow educator, uh, somebody who, as I mentioned at the very start of the webinars we were ramping up, is somebody who knows the Rhone nearly and dearly, not only being an ambassador and an official educator of the Rhone Valley Appalachian, but a part-time resident, I might add too, as her and her family spend um, a chunk of the year um, in the Southern Rhone, she has a, a, an apartment in Avignon and um, not only uh, knows from what she speaks, but you'll notice that even on this slide, several of the photographs um, that we're gonna see today are courtesy of her for which I guess I'll have to pay royalties later, but I don't know. <laughs> anyway, bienvenue Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope everybody will enjoy the back and forth that Sarah have with uh, the vintners and, my, and uh, myself a little bit later on. You, well, thank Sarah. you so much, Evan. It's a real pleasure to be here and among all of these very distinguished guests today presenting the wines of the Côte d'Iron. I'm here in, in Toronto, uh, Canada, so I wouldn't actually be able to physically be there with you if you were in person anyway. So I'm really pleased that this has worked out and I'm looking forward to being in Avignon in the next few weeks after two years of absence due to COVID. Um, but what a good place here for me to jump in and what I consider to be my home 
home away from home, the city of Avignon, the cultural beating heart of the Côte de Rhone. And although Avignon is located in the southern portion of Rhone, due south um, of Orange, between the villages of Sinargue and Gadagne, uh, one of the more recent named villages. Um, the, the relatively recent creation of something known as Le Carré du Palais, which you can see here in this image, um, makes this city a real gateway to the Côte de Rhone. So this, um, this uh, area here, Le Carré du Palais, is both privately and public uh, publicly funded. It's an educational center, it's a wine bar, an archival cellar, and it's right across from the majestic Palais du Pape, which you see here in the image a little bit lower. This is the old Vatican City that housed seven successive popes in the 14th and 15th century. And I think it's important just to preface our talk today by a little bit of history as it relates to wine. Um, the papacy actually moved from Rome to Avignon as a result of the election of a French Pope Clement V. And as you can imagine, this was a relatively unpopular decision in Rome. The stress forcing Clement V to move to the papal capital um, in Avignon. And here Clement V began planting papal vineyards just outside of Ventoux. And successive French popes were able to really expand the reach of uh, the Rhone Valley vineyards and proliferating much of, of what we know of the Côte de Rhone today, um, certainly providing some guaranteed revenue. All right, we can flip to the next one here. So we titled this presentation, Color Me Rhone. And to that end, I have a little anecdote to share with you that I've heard several times, but only in the village of Laudin, which we are going to get to shortly. So this, this story involves this original concept, which would have been like think tanks sometime in the early 20s to mid 30s, around the time of the inception of the AOC and some of the early recognition of the Appalachians of the Rhone Valley. And the idea was that there was going to be three main Appalachians or crews in the Southern Rhone to first inaugurate. So one would be for red, Chateau neuf du Pape, one for Rosé, Tavel, and one for white, and that would have been that of Laudin. But as the story goes, the growers and producers of Laudin couldn't quite agree on being best known for white wines. So this very historic wine producing village was officially defined at a much later date in 67. And now it's known as a village that's authorized to produce all three colors of wine with a notable strength in white wine, which sets it apart from a lot of the other Southern villages. So facts are fiction, fiction. it certainly sets uh, a stage here for, for today's exploration of the colors of the Rhone. So you see this tricolor banner here. And I, for one, would really like to see Loda as a future crew of the Côte d'Iran, which may happen sooner rather than later. As so, they say, I did not know any of that. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Hey, that's what I'm here for. So the Côte d'Iran Appalachian, let's just take a look at that and dive into that because it's going to be useful for us to know when we get to the wines. So the Côte d'Iran and the Côte d'Iran village together make up 60% of the total production, which you might actually expect of the Rhone Valley AOCs. Now you may have seen this diagram before, either in your books or online, um, but this is a nice updated version here because it shows the 22 Côte d'Iran villages with geographic graphic names. If we had done this presentation last year, it would have been 21. So just pay attention to the hierarchy here of Côte du Rhône, followed by Côte du Rhône village. Above that, the Côte du Rhône village with 22 geographic names, and then the crues. So these get more restrictive and restrictive um, the further you go up in the pyramid. Yeah. What's interesting, actually, if I remember last year, um, Nyons, which was that 22nd ad on the Côte du village with geographic names, literally happened two days before the seminar started. So we didn't have the appropriate stuff, but we, we, we got to talk about it. I do think it's important before I move the slide, uh, Sarah, that we remind everybody that the whole concept of geographical names is that not every village is actually a village. You know, you have Massif du Chaux, you have Plan de Dieu, which are 
plots of land, if you will, but there's not like a post office or a restaurant or, or anything like that in the surrounding area of the vineyards that surround the main town. But uh, Exactly, like Plan de Dieu, that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you see that little pyramid. Let's delve a little bit deeper. That's the overall Côte du Rhône. Now let's get more specific. So just the straight Côte du Rhône Appellation Controlée uh, represents just south of 50% of the production of the entire uh, total region of the Rhône Valley. As I mentioned earlier, there are 171 communes that go from the north in Vienne to Avignon in the south. And the lion's share of, of classic Côte du Rhône does in fact uh, come from the south. It tweaks a little bit more to the red side, a little bit higher than the overall average. And uh, with the whites and reds being split, not quite equal, a little bit more rosé. We talked about Tavelle later, one of my favorite wines. But whites are important in this part of the world, too. Um, what is interesting to note, and we'll see this sort of uh, spoken about and um, uh, predominant uh, across the areas that there are really five different soil types that make up the region. Three of them are based on um, sort of rocky, stony sorts of things. So you've got rocky clay soils. You, of course, have the galets, pebbles, stony deposits and all that. And again, as you, you hit the sort of hill slide slopes, you get that sort of colluvial colluvial mix there and provides nutrients and obviously a consistent water supply and radiates the heat at night, although with climate change, less of a problem than it used to be. My God, I know I've chatted with people um, in Neiman, and they were telling me that, that, that there actually can be too much at times. Then the balance of the other types of soils, of course, are those sandier uh, and low soils, which provide less uniformity um, for the water and they're generally better suited for lighter reds and rosés. And finally, um, as we note here, of just the overall Côte du Appellation Controlée, about a third of it is exported around the world. And we take in here in the good old US of A, 18% of that. So we're fairly good, healthy drinkers of this um, part of the world. Now let's focus specifically on the whites that make up this category. As I said before, and per the last side, 5% total. Uh, the grapes of which I'll go through a few of them in a moment uh, must uh, make up 50% of the blend based on, for lack of better words, the classic grapes. So that would include Grenache Blanc, Claret, Marsan Rousson, uh, Bourboulon and Viognier. Um, Picpoul and Uni Blanc are smaller supplemental wines, but those um, big big ones must re represent at least 50% of the blend. One of the things that you'll note as we taste the wines, and I'm sure through your own experience, is that the beauty of so many of these wines is not only in their balance and their lovely um, acids and all that, but there's also texture. And for people that are loving, you know, having a hard time weaning themselves off of Chardonnay, because they love the gras, they love the fat, they love the texture of that variety, um, white roans in particular provide a wonderful, um, uh, gateway to leave uh, Chardonnay and to move on to some other grapes. So I said before, you have a bunch of grapes here um, that do make up the area. Um, and the big ones here are, of course, Grenache Blanc, Bourboulon, Crête, Viognier, Marsan, and Roussan. And um, each one uh, brings something different to the party, if you will. So Grenache Blanc, which is important, obviously, very vigorous grape, uh, gives you body a little bit lower in acid and is known um, just for sort of a warmth and mellowness and uh, glow, if you will, across the wines. Claret, uh, which is lower vigor, tends to provide alcohol and contributes interesting flavor profiles. Um, one can usually find like fennel, apple, limes, um, slightly underripe apricots, etc., peach maybe. And it's also Factoid for all of you, one of the oldest of the uh, varieties in all of south of France. That's pretty cool. Bourboulon, also high vigor, also high yielding. Uh, found more towards the, um, uh, well, actually all around in that part of the world um, and brings a lot of the floral elements. Marsan that we associate a lot with the north. Um, particularly, but you can find it in the South too, also high vigor and yielding, um, generally adds um, uh, sort of tertiary aromas, again, some florality, some of those nuttier aromas that are not necessarily oxidative or oak related can be brought in through this grape. And Marsan, sort of an average vigor grape, gives you all of the, uh, just the opulence of the wines. You get the florals, the honeysuckle, the iris, the, the white cherries, the opulent fruit, all of that good stuff. And then Viognier, we know um, that sun-seeking grape that it is, is a lower vigor, mellow, um, but just fragrant with, with nuts and, and sort of explosive, juicy um, peaches and nectarines and all sorts of good uh, things like that. So lots of fun white grapes that we play with in this part of the world. Which leads us to our first glass. And if you haven't been jumping into all your glasses and not jumped into glass one yet, you should. And I'm going to ask uh, Florence uh, Kio, who's joining us here 
from our fam her family estate to, to speak. I just want to point out that the structure that you see for this slide, not only the beautiful bottle shot on the right and the little factoids about the family, which I'm not going to read because we're lucky enough to have Florence with us today. Nevertheless, all the other information, which is, uh, for lack of better words, tech sheet based, not only can you download the tech sheets, as you know, from the invitation and the welcome thing that you got when you came to this conference, but um, all of it's going to be here too. So she's going to really spend more time talking about the property, the winery yourself, and of course, tasting the wine. Florence. So hi, everybody. Hi, so some word about Chami Q. Uh, we are a familiar winemaker since 1748. So I'm the 13th generation. And I work with my brother. Uh, together, we, we run and own uh, something like six, ex, six uh, estates. So perhaps you know some other estate. For example, Domaine Houchard, Côte de Provence Rosé, or Domaine du Villazaré in Chateauneuf du Pape, because we export quite a lot in the US. Um, but today we, we are um, showing a, a, a wine from Chateau du Trignon. So we are specialized in Southern Rhone Valley and Côte de Provence, and we export 97% of our production in more than 30 countries. So an average an average, uh, as we can uh, see in the previous slide, is 30%, but we are many exporter with 97%. So concerning uh, Chateau du Trignon, more especially, we, um, we purchased it in 2006, and uh, it at the very feet of a wonderful landscape with Les Dentelles de Montmirail, that is a really, really lovely um, cliff, um, very near from Gigondas. So it's a very beautiful and Provencal landscape, very typical, uh, something like a dream there. Um, before we purchase it, it belongs to another family uh, for more than five generations. And when this previous family purchased the Chateau du Trignon in uh, 1886, it used to be a mixed farming. So you have different kinds of production. And the fifth generation that succeeded in uh, the Chateau du Trignon um, tried to focus on wine. So when we purchase the estate, we only have uh, some plant of wine now, and we are not a mixed farming today. So during the year 60s, they try to, to progress in quality. So they uh, built a gravity cellar and they try to adapt the grape varieties to the terroir. So it's a very important thing um, to have the well adaptation of grape variety terroir because it's a very good for the quality and everything. And after we can adapt the um, taking care of the vineyard. Of course, now you've got a very big importance of sustainable, of bio or biodynamic, but it's not the only way to take care of your terroir. And as I all, always say, perhaps we are not biologic or something like this, but we are winemaker and the terroir is our heritage, is our property. So we do not want to, to destroy it. So it's very important to take care of it. So after, was, why the name Trignon? So Trignon is the name of the very small river that is uh, along the, the property. The Chateau du Trignon is the ch chateau of the river Trignon. So this is the story of the estate. Uh, after concerning the wine, so um, the white is only 5% uh, in the Côte du Rhône. So it's not very, very famous, of course, but it's a very interesting product because of course, red are everywhere in Côte du Rhône. We are very famous for that, but white are ready wine to have, to have and to discover. Um, generally in Southern Rhône Valley, we blend all the grape variety. We have, uh, as we said before, Grenache, uh, we have uh, Roussan, Marsan, Dionier, Bourboulin, and Claret. So each grape variety has its own particularity. But when we arrive in Chateau du Trignon, in the estate, we had Roussan, Marsan, and Dionier. So with my brother, we decided to, to vinify each grape variety in a tank. And after, 
month after month, we, we have found that each grape variety has its own personality. So that's why we decided to keep each uh, wine like a cuvee. So that we made 100% of Roussan, 100% of Marsan, and 100% of Viognier. Of course, it, each wine is very, very different. And with these three cuvées, each consumer can discover by himself the difference between the grape variety. Most of the producer blend them together, um, but we decided to make separate wine. So generally we say that the Roussan is elegant, the Marsan is subtle, uh, and the Viognier is very intense. So that's a three different kinds of grape variety. So the, the, the wine is, it's, it, I think it's a treat for, for all of us to have the opportunity um, to try them as individual varieties. Yeah. To your point, most everybody blends them in certain degrees. And I think the wine yeah. shows très roussan, if you will, you know, it has those lifted uh, things and, and it is an elegant wine, but it also shows, I think, that the complexity of, of flavors, the, the, the stone fruits, you know, for me, I always find this sort of like albino white cherry character uh, there along with the lifted florals and, and all that. And I think the wine is, um, it's just lovely. And Florence, this is rare upon rare that we have here, right? I mean, already we've seen, you know, such a small amount of white wine production overall in the Rhone, but now we actually get to see in the Southern Rhone, we actually get to see um, the this, this white incarnation of a single varietal like this. Can I just ask what, you mentioned that it was this historic vintage you wanted to show them off, but that's a pretty kind of avant-garde or, or modern, um, modern concept. What kind of feedback have you had from, from other producers in, in the Côte d'Ivoire? From other producer, I don't really know, but um, from, pro, from consumer, uh, a very good um, feedback. But for, for us, we made these three different cuvées for more than 50 years now. So it's not a, a novelty and it's not a, a trend or something like this. It's just what we decided some years ago. And uh, some years ago, uh, white wine were very, very unusual. And now it's continued to progress, to, to increase. So I think it's a very good thing. And I think that uh, Côte du Rhône want to, to progress in that uh, sense, in that way. <laughs> I also, well, no, I, I also remind I also remind us, Sarah, that, that if I if I heard uh, Florence correctly, they uh, they export ninety seven percent. So the three percent that's there probably get consumed by the winery. So the other producers don't even know what they're doing because they wouldn't know unless they would were here. <laughs> no, but I have always thought you were very forward thinking, even and and but still holding on to tradition. And I think that's an important part of of your legacy and what you've done. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, thank you, Florence. So Florence, like all of our other vintners, will join us uh, towards the end for the Q&A and for the, for the happy half hour. So, Sarah, I'm going to kick everybody. it back. To, oh, it's our pleasure. I'm going to kick it back to you because I'm going to be handling um, the sort of, for lack of better words, uh, classic wines, and then Sarah's going to ha be handling the individual village. So um, what are the, there's some differences for, uh, for the whites for village versus regular, right? Yes, and here we go. Actually, we're going to talk a little bit now about setting up the Côte du Rhône village, uh, AOC here. Um, so as you can see, it's 12% um, of the total Rhone Valley uh, production. And that's all of the Rhone Valley production, not just Côte du Rhône. And this makes up a pretty substantial amount of the wine. It, it may come from any of the 95 villages, including the 22 name villages, which can be used on the label. And as a sidebar, I just wanted to reiterate your point that you, that was made uh, earlier, Evan, that sometimes the name vi village isn't actually one village, but the name given to a designated viticultural area like Plan de Dieu. So these are wines made from, you know, Camaret sur Aigue and Jonquière and Viol and, and Travaillant. Um, but they have this particular name. But I digress. All right. So the AOC of the Côte du Rhône Village, this was created back in 1967, which is significantly later than the 1937 date for the uh, more generic Côte du Rhône. And this is a tier in which we often see this upward movement to the cru level, most recently in 2016 with the, the promotion of, of Kiran from a village to a cru level. So the trick is though, at the cru level, you have to give up the use of the word um, Côte du Rhône village that is associated with the village itself and carries a lot of weight and recognition. All right, can we, 
Ah, actually, I should just mention here too that quite a bit of it is exported. And I thought it was quite significant that 16% of, of the total of the 36% that's exported ends up in the US. You're lucky down there. I think our number is significantly smaller in Canada. We're really thirsty and there's a lot of us here. <laughs> you are. All right, so Coturonne Village. Now I just wanted to give you a visual. This is in your books. You can have a look at this much more closely. So you can see here, it is true. There are 95 villages and they can be listed on a map here, um, including the 22 Côte Durand Village with geographic names that can be used on the, um, can be used on the actual label, right? So have a look at the Interone website to get Sorry. more details there. No, that's exactly what I was doing. You're reading my mind, Sarah. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of the geographic names, as I mentioned previously, upward movement here is very much possible within the village, village with geographic indicator and, you know, the whole crew pyramid as we've seen. And just as there's momentum from a name village to a crew, there's also the possibility of movement from a generic village to a named village. In fact, there have been 22 such moves and we alluded to Nyons is the most recent example in 2016. And uh, sorry, recent example in 2020. And as you can see here from, from some of these names and lists that you become more and more familiar with that there was quite a boom in 2016 with the, um, with the uh, inauguration there of Saint-Cécile, Suze la Rousse and, and Vison la Romaine further to the north here in the southern portion of the Rhone Valley. So moving on there, we're gonna flip over and we're gonna see now these colors, and I love this diagram, and you can also find it as well on the Interone website, but you can see all the colors here. And um, it gives a great visual to so the styles of wine that can be produced in all 22 villages. And it's important to realize that not all villages can produce all three colors of wine. And, you know, these rules have evolved to respect what, what can be produced in, in each of these reason, regions here. But not just practically, because there can be cultural reasons as well for these decisions. Um, we're going to be tasting a wine from Vison shortly, and you can see here that it can produce all three colors in our colorful banner that we mentioned earlier. All right, so in terms of Blanc, we saw we had a Blanc there from the Côte du Rhône Appellation, but you can also produce uh, Blanc in the Côte du village, a, quite a small amount is produced within this banner of Côte du village, only 3.6% of total uh, production here, so quite, quite rare. Um, at least 50% of the blend must be made up of those main varieties that you were mentioning, uh, again, um, Evan, Grenache Blanc, Clarette, one of my favorites. It, does, it gives both power and elegance there. Um, Marsan and Roussan that we all know very well now, and then a smaller percentage of the, of the other varieties. Oh, and we're moving on to these nice images of Vison here, and you can see all these really pebbly soils, and it's quite remarkable how the, the texture of these soils, it's, um, you can find some galley, but it's not usually the big galley, you can find these nice smooth little pebbles here that help to um, reflect the sunshine and heat up the grapes, and Vison tends to be an area that, um, is, uh, is a little bit more elevated. Uh, when I think of Vison, I think of high elevation chalk, right? So Vison became this papal possession in the 14th century. And since it's really helped position itself as what we call an enclave, right? Effectively a small piece of Avignon or the Vaucluse in which Avignon is situated, surrounded by the Drôme Provençal. And the Drôme Provençal is where you get all this beautiful Garrigue aromatics, right? The Aleppo pine, which is native to the Mediterranean. You see them in Morocco and Algeria and Lebanon. It's also home to a lot of the lavender and truffles. And if you have a chance to visit, it's a great time to visit just at the beginning of June when they're, the, when they're harvesting all of the lavender and just everything smells like lavender. All right, so Vison itself is located, as you can see here, on the eastern 
bank here and it produces a significant amount of red wine. And I love the sort of crunchiness you can, um, that is exhibited by the red wines here. Just a little bit of rosé at 2% and 4% white. So it's had that status um, since, uh, since 1966. And here that Mistral really blows with great force in Vizan. I always thought it really uh, takes, kicks up a lot of the dust and underbrush and lovely aromas of uh, the Southern Rhone. All right, so a fun fact here, this is a really old wine producing area. And I've actually found um, uh, this communal press and there has been a communal press in Vison as early as the 13th century in 1250. Again, I, I did not know that. So some things that you can expect in Vison in terms of flavor profile, I thought I would just put this together for you. Maybe you can pick up some of these characteristics and uh, maybe this is helpful for, for some of you. Uh, we might find that we've got some exceptions in the mix. Um, but, um, you know, the, the reds and the little whites and rosés, as I mentioned, really have that, um, that lavender and anise and, and you know, these pine needle smell to them. The reds often have this spice, this natural fruit spice about them um, and, and pepper and and certainly a, a minerality. Rosés here, you'll notice that have this very pretty floral peppery character and the whites tend to have um, quite a bit of delicacy surprisingly um, for uh, a region that's in the southern Rome but it really has to do a little bit with its altitude and its slightly more northern positioning and so you get these more delicate citrusy and, and stone fruit not so much veering into the tropical notes. All right, so now we get to our wine number two. I think you guys are getting thirsty. So this is by Ronéa, and here we're going to bring on Clema to talk to us a little bit about this reimagined cooperative model, which features I think, over 388 um, wine growers and, and wine growers that um, certainly have a very similar philosophy. So Clément, are you- Hello everyone. You? Bonjour. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. It's really nice and uh, really a beautiful focus on Vison. Uh, so my name is Clément, and I head up operation in USA for Ronea. So for those who don't know us, uh, we are a union of small estates uh, that produce craft-made wines from South Ron. Okay. So we just few other words. We uh, we became last year one of the top producer of Cru. So we have a kind of a huge expertise in Cru and Côte du Rhône village. This is why I'm going to talk about the Côte du Rhône village today with you. So we're going to talk about the Côte du Rhône village, but a white. And I think it's really interesting, actually. Even if you see that uh, it's really a small percentage right now uh, of the, the production, it's actually uh, the trend that is kind of the more, having the more like increase. So worldwide, like there is like a 20% evolution of the whites of Côte du Rhône, so it's really growing. And in USA, it's like plus 40%, I think, in whites uh, since the beginning of the year. So I think it's two reasons why you should really pay attention to this wine, because it's gonna be, a, it's kind of trendy. And I think people will look for whites and Côte du Rhône and Rhône Valley as a really a, a good part to play. So now let's go to the wine. What I wanted to, to tell about the wine is like just three points or four points that I, that I think could be interesting for you guys. So the first one is like, as you have seen with Sarah, Vizan is like kind of, uh, it's in the South Rhone, okay? But it's like the Northern village of South Rhone. So what is gonna be really interesting is like, you, you will have the generosity of South Rhone, but you will have like really uh, much more freshness. So that's my first point. On the, the second point I would like to talk to you about is the terroir. So you mentioned like uh, pebbles and these soils, what is really funny is like, we don't actually do this wine on these kinds of uh, uh, terroir. We actually produce uh, this Côte du Rhône village on sandy terroir, which is, which is kind of uh, unusual. Uh, it's uh, highly uh, draining in water, but we realized it's uh, the terroir that uh, provides the best uh, condition for the vines to produce uh, kind of uh, the freshness and the aromatic we're looking for. Uh, on the cultivar, uh, 
even like uh, told us a lot about the different cultivar of Ron, it's really uh, interesting. And, and, and also uh, the Famicio. Uh, I remember that they talk about the claret and kind of uh, the, the acidity of it and the, and the mention and also like the viognier with the explosive aromas and the, the tents. Well, we made a choice uh, as uh, Famicio did on the Roussal. We decided to focus on uh, Grenache, Viognier and Claret. And it's not, uh, it's just we did a specific choice because we were looking for Northern expression of Grenache, Viognier and acidity of the Claret. And we were really looking to, to build up, uh, you know, Rhone could be bold heavy. We're really, really looking to do like, kind of like our expertise in Cru, a specific tense uh, acid and a really fresh uh, version of a Cote d'Iron. So that's why you, you will have these grapes uh, in, the, in the wine. And to be honest, I, I wanted to share also the vision of the winemakers that is really like, uh, we're expert of Cru. So we vinify these wines as Cru. And uh, the vision we have for the whites is really to look for, as I told you, uh, tense, uh, fresh and aromatic, but finesse, not too much generosity or bold. So now uh, I wanted to share a, a fun point, a, a, a funny story. The, the wine is called Notre Dame des Vignes. Okay, so for those who would wonder what it is, uh, it's actually like uh, Notre Dame des Vignes is like kind of lady of the vines. And so there is a kind of a legend uh, that uh, some wine growers found uh, a statue of uh, Lady Mary in the vineyard. So they decided to put it back into a church. And the morning uh, after, by magic, they found it again in the vineyard. And they did it twice, like put it back to the church. And it went back into the vineyard. So they decided that it was a sign. And they built a church at this place. And our vineyards are close to this church. So that's why uh, the name of this wine. Okay, There's just always a reason. There's always a reason. Yes. Thank you for coming well, on. To be, just to finish and to be quick, my personal opinion is like, uh, I think it's interesting because people will, people will uh, look for whites, I think, more and more. So maybe some of you have uh, seen it. Côte du Rhône is like 60% of Rhône sales, and it's really reassuring. As uh, Ivan told, it's like everyone knows it and, and, is, and feels good about it. So I think a, a white Côte du Rhône will be a, an easy uh, kind of uh, wines for American consumer. And to finish in kind of, uh, I think it would be really interesting to bring like uh, typicity into the profile, to bring something different into the market than just a, a standard Côte du Rhône. So I think that's why this wine, I think it's interesting for me. Thank you uh, for listening. Great, Clément. Thank you so much. And, and what a treat to um, also um, have this juxtaposition. So the first wine um, was a single variety, uh, you know, monocépage, and then the second wine is a blend. And I think if you go back and taste the first wine now against the second, you get that sort of purity of voice of the single variety there, but you get the one plus one equals three, if you will, equation of the blend in the second wine and can actually find that th little thread um, you know, of, of, uh, you know, of, of um, just sort of difference, the one versus the other. Thank you so much, Clément, for your, for your time. And um, yeah, I think white wines are going to be on the rise and um, the statistics seem to show that and thank you for backing it up. Let's move on now and switch our gears to Rosé. Um, Rosé, as we said earlier, makes up uh, about 8% of the production and it's been pretty stable over the years. I think that's something, at least if I was in the Rhone, I would take pride in the fact that I'm not a Johnny come lately or a Jeanne come lately or a Jean come lately uh, as far as you know, jumping on the, the, the rosé bandwagon when you've been doing it for a long period of time. Uh, these wines are blends. Um, I've not actually even heard of any um, single great variety rosés. I'm sure they exist out there, but they haven't been marketed that way. And once again, you have to have at least two principal great varieties. We'll talk about those uh, in a minute of which Grenache is mandatory to be one of them and must be um, at least 60% of the blend. Generally, um, it's gonna be the GMS, the GSM, the whatever, the Grenache Mauvais and Syrah that make up the, 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 the heart of this. And interestingly enough, we never really ever think about it, but um, there is the ability to add white wines into your rosés um, for acid, for, for lifted aromatics, for a number of other things, but they can't make up any more than 20% of that. Um, and it's interesting when you go around the individual regions. I remember talking with some friends in Meme where they said, you know, we barely make any white as it is. Why would we put it into our rosé when we've got so much red? So you're going to see that change as you move across some um, 
the Rhone Valley. As I said before, there are a lot of different grapes here. Um, the only two that you won't see on this that, that, that are making up would be uh, Couston and Caladoc, which you probably heard of there. They're not on the, on the map here because they're still in, for lack of better words, a testing phase. All of these other remaining three, six, nine, 11, 13, 14 grapes, if I count correctly, um, both reds and grays, you know, you can see the Grenache Gris and obviously Claire Jose um, are all permitted within that, but the big three are the big three. But interestingly enough, we're all familiar with a number of them. I think one that surprises everybody oftentimes, they don't think of it as being sort of quote unquote native and typical of the Rhone is Marcelon. Uh, Marcelon being of course a blend of Grenache with Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and so many people um, love it, but many people think, well, it's got part Bordeaux stock in it, so we don't want it, da 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 da. And I've actually gotten into a food fight with a vintner about the uh, existence of Marcelon in the Rhone Valley. And um, I took one side, they took the other, and I got the food thrown at me, but we won't go into that one at all. <laughs> um, let's talk about a rosé now that we've actually got one. I want you to pick up a glass of wine three um, if you haven't done so already. Um, needless to say, there are some heralded names of producers that make wines all across uh, the Rhone Valley. The House of Gigal uh, is one of them. Many of us really know them for their uh, Cru wines and specifically for their Northern Cru wines, but they do just a jolly job in other parts. And their rosé, I think, is very um, indicative of what's going on there. Um, the Gigals are still in harvest mode and all of that, but they've, uh, they've um, asked their adopted son, Patrick. Patrick, if you want to join us and talk to us a little bit, this is, again, uh, a respected um, family and one that's really done a great job of elevating the position, the stature, and an homage to the network of growers that they work with um, and really um, done an amazing job. So Patrick, please take us Welcome, through, uh, through this wine. Thank you, everybody. Welcome. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here pinch hitting for Philippe Gigal, who is, uh, as usual, um, overcommitted uh, co uh, from day to day. Um, in any event, my name is Patrick Will, and I'm very, uh, I've been uh, <clears throat> honored to work with Gigal for more than a quarter century right now. So uh, I guess that says something. Uh, uh, anyway, we won't get into age. But uh, the bottom line is I have some familiarity with them and, and, the, and a real pleasure working with the family. Just a little background on the wineries. Um, it's relatively new. It, given the what we've been looking at going back to the 14th century and so forth already today, uh, the Gigal Winery was founded in 1946 by Etienne Gigal, and they're they're based in the Northern Rhone in the town of Bampuy. That's where their cellars are located. There, all of their um, facilities and so forth, and they do have a, an important estate in the north, uh, and more recently. Um, uh, they've acquired a property in Chateau Neuf de Pop, so they have a uh, called Chateau de Nalis now, and they have a, a footprint there as well. So, uh, but they've been established as uh, uh, proprietors, obviously, but a very important negociant company uh, for um, over half a century. And uh, the Cote de Rhone's, all three colors, have been uh, an important part of their business uh, uh, for many, many years. Uh, the um, uh, the Cote de Rhone Rosé is. Uh, relatively new compared to the red. Uh, it's, it's been there for a few decades. They've been making rosé uh, almost since the beginning. But this is a, uh, again, it's a 100% negociant wine, purchased wines from growers, Philippe and his father, Marcel, um, who run the winery now together. Um, they, they, uh, they taste and purchase from, uh, from growers every year, uh, and they work with the growers to specify what they um, uh, what they want in the wine. Uh, for the most part, this is all stainless steel fermentation, of course. And uh, additionally, Philippe is uh, insistent, if he can get it, get this, on having skin contact rosé as opposed to blended. Uh, so that's uh, just a <clears throat> one, one point that he's very important. They like the structure that the, uh, the skin contact will give to the, uh, to the wine, and uh, they would like to make a wine that's balanced, but also powerful. Uh, they don't allow it to go through malolactic, and uh, they, when it's, uh, when it's, possible to control that uh, at the grower level. And uh, so they have a, a wine that's both deep and, and powerful at the same, and uh, still elegant and fresh at the same time. Uh, I would note that uh, the, the assemblage uh, is of course uh, Grenache dominant as is required by law, but uh, additionally, um, they, they love the use of Senso and they try to put as much as that as they can find in the, in the blend each year uh, for its aromatic uh, character, which is really quite expressive. And of course, Syrah adds to the, uh, adds to the, uh, the depth. Uh, Philippe uh, shared with me the fact, however, this is a bit of a party line blend listed here, the percentages, and uh, they are very fond of putting, Philippe says, whenever I can find good old vine Carignan Rosé, I love to include that in the blend as well. He said, yeah, it's, it's a real smoky character to it, which uh, 
which uh, they do in certain uh, certain vintages. Um, in this style, I mentioned it's a little, this is a little more delicate than what you might find, uh, I think, uh, say in, uh, in Tavel, for example, which has a lot more minerality and, and, and structure. Uh, it's a uh, it's a wine that's released right after the first of the year. So it, uh, but nonetheless, um, they always produce the wine in the style that, as I mentioned, is, is somewhat robust. I think rosé in some ways has uh, gotten a little bit of a, um, uh, not a bad rap, but just it's been pigeonholed a little bit as, as a, a wine of the year, of the, of the current year. And in fact, these rosés, uh, many Cote de Rhone rosés, uh, and Gigal's included, uh, really last beautifully for two to three years in bottle. And I uh, and, uh, have no problem about opening one, two or three years of age uh, and expecting it still to be fresh and, and so forth. They usually are. Um, and um, as I mentioned, it, the, the wine is uh, a little closer to Tavel in weight than you might find in Provence rosés, which are, of course, extremely popular these days in the United States. And uh, but it, ha it has some structure and, and so forth. So I'm going to uh, the production. I guess I should I should point out there it's significant. Uh, they produce around 40,000 cases a year, nine liter cases uh, in a good year. I don't know what 21 is going to offer with the relatively low yields we have in the South. But uh, the, uh, uh, the Philippe says it's about one percent. Of the, of, the, of the production of Cote de Rhone Rosé of the Rhone that they're responsible for. So it's widely available uh, and um, uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you enjoy the wine very much. And as I said, it's an honor to be able to present the wine on Philippe's uh, behalf this afternoon. Thank you, thank you, Patrick. And I think he would be proud of, of the job you did. And thank you for sharing some of those cool factoids. First of all, I appreciate the fact that um, in so many cases where, where you know, rosé is a, for lack of better words, byproduct of Seigneur and trying to concentrate red wines, and then it's just, you know, Chateau cash flow for, for a lot of people. I'm always drawn to the fact that when people make dedicated rosés with the intent of rosé from day one, um, that's a really cool thing. And then always finding out they have a secret ingredient that may not be listed on the assemblage is a treat for all of us. And finally, um, I would just add that even though there's a, a fair amount of it made, it great, it comforts me and warms the cockles of my heart to know that for a lot of people who are having this as their introduction uh, because of availability to rosés from um, the Rhone Valley, you get an example as, as well made as this one. So uh, please thank the Gigal family uh, for us. We will uh, tell Monsieur Gigal next time we talk to him that you did a great job and we appreciate it. And with that, Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you as we move to individual village now. Right, and we're we're staying in rosé, and you know, with the increasing global demand for rosé, um, it's it's nice to see that Gigal is keeping up with uh, with a more substantial amount of production, and maybe we'll continue to see that a little bit creep up, a little bit more and more in their own, uh, and the, the Côte du village. So you can see here, Côte du village makes up only one, it's only one percent of rosé uh, made in the the banner under the banner of Côte du village. So we're having a rare treat indeed coming up. Um, so <clears throat> the, the main varieties must be used. They're mandatory. They must make up 66% of the blend. Grenache being the most important and due to its thin skins, it makes an ideal candidate for rosés. Um, white varieties um, cannot make up more than 20% of the plantings. You'll see that and just don't get confused because it can be tricky. We're not talking about the blends, we're talking about the plantings that are used. Um, so let's move on now to the village here of Seguré. And I love this picture. You know, some people consider this the most beautiful village in all of France. And you can tell by um, <clears throat> its kind of hill, its hilltop situation here um, and the village sort of surrounds that hill and you can see the vineyards starting to creep up in elevation in around Seguré. This is one of the most beautiful sites at night to drive around because you can see all the, the lights um, in these homes and it lights up the hillside. All right, so let's move on to some of the stats of Seguré. So we see here at According to our map, we're still now on the east side of the Rhone Valley. You know, I always get confused when we say right and left bank. A lot of people like to say right and left bank, but all the maps are situated so 
<laughs> north. So I always get turned around and use east and west when I'm talking about the Rhone. Um, so the, the village of Ségure is actually uh, on one of the tributaries there along the Ouvez Valley, and it's at the foot of these Dentelles de Montmirail, which uh, Florence was talking about, these sort of outcroppings that look like teeth, um, especially at the top, and they're you know, unmistakable when you're driving through uh, the Côte -Rhône. Now, the Côte -Rhône village here has had, as we mentioned, Appalachian status a little bit later than that of the Côte -Rhône. And um, <clears throat> a fun fact here is that in Séguré, in, in Provençal, means safe. And uh, it must have something to do with um, having a very high outpost to see any invading forces. So here, uh, grapes are planted on these terraces. So you will see some terrace sites, um, and as well as you'll see those that are a little bit lower on in the slope and terrace. And you'll find all this um, very characteristic kind of soil type, a mix of clay and limestone. But, you know, the, the, the hills surrounding the village is up to 350 meters. So once again, we get some elevation and you can play with aspects here as well to um, getting a little bit more sunshine or a little bit more shading, uh, depending on the style of wine you're going to make. And one little point here is that 4.5% in Séguré, not in Côte du Rhône village, in Séguré is rosé. So we get a little bit more rosé here in this village. So the, both the whites and the reds, because of we saw that kind of elevation and those aspects that they can play with, have this distinctive freshness. Um, we saw Vison as well too, when we're looking at villages here in the whites and rosés that have a little bit more freshness. And um, to that end, a little bit floral as well too. Um, but because of those great aspects, you can get a little bit more tropical in here. And the reds, on the other hand, um, tend to be a little bit less powerful than some of the neighboring crews, which are right next door, Quiran, Rasto, and Plan de Dieu, which is a little bit flatter and a little bit more sun-soaked. So let's take a look at wine number four. This is the 2020, a really nice fresh bottling of Domaine de Mourchon Louis, um, Séguré, Rosé here. And we're going to bring Kate McKinley on. Kate, you have a very interesting story about a Scottish family establishing themselves in, um, the, uh, in finding some really interesting sites here in vineyards in the late uh, 1990s, right? That's right. Well, I was actually trying to uh, draw parallels between myself and Florence of family Kia. I suppose it's true that I'm representing our family vineyard, but I am in fact only second generation. And uh, yeah, we, ha we haven't been around quite as long as Florence and her family. But my parents came here 25 years ago from Scotland um, and they found and fell in love with uh, 17 hectares of vines that had been all but abandoned. Nobody else wanted to buy them because they were up at the top of Segue at 350 meters. Um, <clears throat> they were planted on steep slopes, so difficult to farm mechanically. Old vines, so not producing enough yield to sell onto the co-ops. And uh, Quite interestingly, 25 years ago, they were not always meeting the maturity that was uh, people were looking for. Some of the, the vines are northwest orientated. So even though my parents couldn't taste uh, what was coming from the plot because everything was being sold to the co-op, they could see that the potential was there and they went ahead and bought the old vines and took advantage of the hillside and built a modern gravity fed winery. So uh, that's that's what we've got today. So yes, yeah, so here we are in that uh, commune of Segure, uh, one of the 22 Côte d'Ouen village. Uh, one of those uh, villages that are interesting to know about because we share a boundary up the top and at the back of our hill with Gigondas. Um, so pretty much the same ingredients up here as they get over there under the dentelle. Uh, but of course, we don't always ask the same premium prices. So I think it was Robert Parker who said that the Côte village were the 
are the happy hunting ground of the wine savvy bargain hunter. It's really worth knowing about these small villages from just from a value point of view. And as you did a very nice job earlier, Sarah, also from a tourist point of view, uh, very nice places to visit um, and to bring your bicycle as well. Anyway, um, I just want to pick up uh, on what Evan was saying earlier about the consistency in rosé production here and how despite the extraordinary revolution we've seen globally in rosé consumption, we have stayed pretty constant in our production. And I just wanted to explain a little bit about why that is, certainly as far as our estate is concerned. We make, of course, mostly red wines here, probably 85% uh, of our production is red. Um, and like most of our colleagues here, the, the style we're looking to achieve is a, is a concentrated, bold red wine. And in order to do that, we like to wait until the vines are at least 20 years old and more um, to start getting that nice concentrated juice full of the character for the reds. So uh, we cherish our older vines, but we know that they're not gonna be around forever. And so what we like to have in our, in our portfolio of vines on the estate is a sort of constant roster of different generations of vines. So uh, while we're waiting for the younger vines to come of age till they're 20, 25 years old, so we can use the production for the reds, the perfect thing to do with them is to make rosé because they're producing those nice, vigorous, juicy, mouth-watering um, fruit. So uh, that's one of the reasons it fits into our repertoire here, but also for our own personal use. Uh, consumption. Um, we wanted to make a rosé that would suit us and our lifestyle here. And um, of course, those big reds aren't always so palatable in the heat of summer. So we're looking for something that's going to be just a bit more than a, a, a van der Swaf. Uh, something uh, we don't contrary to what a lot of people think, sit around by our swimming pools all the time drinking rosé here. It's often to accompany, you know, dinner in the evening or whatever. So we wanted to make something that just had a little bit more weight and richness to it. So uh, this rosé is a, is a mix of cold soak and direct press. Uh, it's got a little bit more syrup than a lot of roses locally. And I think that's what gives it just that um, extra structure, that middle weight in the palate that can make it a food, food friendly option. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it, it strikes me um, as being, you know, the, the, the term uh, van gastronomique gets thrown around a lot. And, you know, oftentimes when we think of, for lack of better words, the super serious rosés, we think of Tavel and, and things like that. This wine, to me, very much hit me that way, too. And whether it's the Syrah, whether it's your interpretation of it or whatever, but not only does it seem to be, for lack of better words, a, a gastronomic and serious rosé, and one that I, I suspect probably will age for a few years quite nicely, given its structure, the brightness, the architecture on it. I, the fact that you've got the Syrah and, and, you know, again, knowing enough about vinification to be dangerous, nevertheless, there's just a slightly phenolic pull on my tongue anyway um, from that. And I actually, for, you know, maybe for sitting around a swimming pool, that's not wonderful. But if I'm thinking about the serious and the gravitas of rosé and its application with food, I actually really like that. And I'm going to try and finish mine a little bit later with something on the table and not just sort of quaff it away. So, okay, thank you so much for uh, bringing us to your property and um, explaining your family and, and this delightful rosé. Really, really Thank cool. you, Kate. This is really beautiful. Really, really appreciate you coming on and telling us the story. It's my pleasure. Thank you. All right. And then last but not least, we're going to move to the land of red, which seems sort of last but not least, certainly not least, because like, as we know, it's the preponderance of Cote de Rome production. 87% of, uh, of the wine in the overall Cote de Rome production is in fact red. Uh, as we, you would suspect, the, the, the principal players need to be um, big, kind of like we talked about for the rosé, but reinforced here for the reds. Grenache is mandatory and must be 60% of the, the blend, and along with more veg, so and the other players, 
um, you can have, um, you know, you can have mixes. What I thought was an interesting factoid, maybe don't, all of you don't know it, maybe you do, but in which case, gosh, that's so cool. There's, there is there is there is actually Cote du Rhone made in the north. There's not a lot of it. The lion's share is clearly um, located in the south. But if you do find a Cote du Rhone made in the north, they can get away with using just one of the uh, principal grape varieties. And needless to say, in the North, that would be Syrah. So that's kind of an interesting thing, a bit of a unicorn story and a unicorn wine, but nevertheless, um, simply to also um, stress that not all Cote du Rhone um, is made exclusively in the South. And again, upwards to those 23 uh, varieties um, are allowed. So within the village, if, if you don't mind, sir, I'm just going to sort of frame this. So I've got actually my yes. Cote of village wine too, before we get to the single village of yours. Um, it's 96% of the production of the total village region is in fact in red wine and Grenache and Syrah, notice here have to be 66% as opposed to the 60 earlier. And again, the, the otherwise um, permitted varieties can make up uh, that. Um, specific on the white varieties, again, a slightly smaller population and they can make up no more than 5%. Again, plantings, as you correctly stated earlier, Sarah, not actual uh, blend. And um, Saran Morved, um, you know, must make up at least 25%. So there, there is that sort of subzone within the 66 of that, uh, that lesser 25. 20 authorized grape varieties. So we subtract a couple when we move into the village level. As you mentioned earlier, um, 67 was the year that this was codified into law and um, over a third uh, gets exported interna internationally. I'm glad you get to, they don't export all of it because Lord knows when you're down there, it's nice to be able to sample the different villages as you move across the region uh, side by side and in um, comparison. So glass of wine number five, it may be um, both familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. Um, it is the uh, Domaine Rangeard is the actual winery vineyard property, although it goes under the La Nerte label in deference to um, its family of being uh, the same folks as uh, over there near Avignon. Uh, it's a, a 40 year old vineyard slash winery. It's managed um, by the same people as uh, Chateau La Nerte. In fact, there's a familial relationship or friendship between the two and when they were sort of moving into what's gonna happen to the uh, this uh, particular Rangeard property, the, uh, the folks there who've been consulting for them and effectively running it for them for years, embrace them with open arms. They're located specifically in Cernion du Comtat, uh, north of Orange, uh, and that's fabulous. I love that word, Massif du Chaux. Calcareous sandstones, not so much clay um, and, and a great concentration. Um, pretty straightforward um, in everything they're doing. I think what is worth noting as you're enjoying this wine, is that they uh, switched over to concrete starting in 2017 um, with the goal being to sort of really preserve and amplify uh, the fruit freshness and the expressions, which they felt um, was perhaps diminished a little bit, particularly in warmer vintages. And we know <laughs> quite well that vintages are getting warmer, not cooler. So, so there was a very calculated uh, thinking of doing that 19 of which this uh, wine is produced was a particularly hot vintage. If those of you who were with us on Monday, I think you might remember my saying that I was in France um, in 2019 as, as part of a, a, a trip I was making. And from the day I landed until the day I left, it didn't drop, um, pardon my, set my uh, Fahrenheit for a moment, Sarah, but it didn't drop below 100 degrees or 101 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for the almost entire time I was there. So if it was warm up north where I was primarily in Normandy, and Paris. I can only imagine what it was like down in the south. Um, yet you don't taste that much shrivel and overtly jammy uh, characters in this wine. Um, I think to the contrary, it shows great balance. Um, it does show, of course, you know, a, a certain savory character. It shows obviously the meatiness of the Syrah, a little bit of leatheriness, but again, a generosity of fruit provided by that Grenache in the, in, in the middle palate. Um, it's, a, it's a great um, a great story, a great property. Um, and while not necessarily, quote unquote, the least expensive uh, Côte du Rhône village on, on the block, I still think that even as, how can I put this, even as a more expensive Côte du Rhône village, it still punches above its weight in terms of giving you essentially a crew character and a crew uh, level of complexity yet in a Côte du Rhône village uh, package. Just a, just a delightful one. So Sarah, let's talk a little bit about villages and um, you can take us to 
Lodan, which is where we started at the beginning yes, of the day. Yes, yes. So our conversation. Mentioned. It's interesting. We, we've tasted two whites and two rosés. And when we get to Lodan, which produces more white, we're going to be tasting a red. But that's okay because, I, you know, producers... And, and Lodan make a lot of red wine, right? And um, they uh, they certainly fought for that that kind of recognition for um, their terrific ter terrific whites. And you can see up there the fortress there overlooking the uh, the vineyards, and you can feel the mistral. You can feel that freshness in the air up in Lodan that is really responsible for for a lot of the whites that are produced there. And you took so, that photo, no less. Very I nice did photo. take that photo. I took it at an angle. I was really like perched under the vineyard. Can't tell from it, but it was uh, quite a yoga move to get that <laughs> aspect, just to show a little bit of the elevation. Now, um, now we're, we're moving over to the western side, the western bank flanking here, La Cez, and, and Laudan actually stretches across several communes. So as mentioned before, some of these villages actually stretch between several com communes here. Um, it's actually known as Caesar's Camp. That's right, the Caesar um, set up camp here because there was such an incredible uh, vantage point uh, from this area. Now, it's it's interesting to know that Laudan, as I was alluding to whites, is the second largest white region in the Côte du Rhône after Chateauneuf-du-Pape. So it's actually quite significantly known for that and the influence of the Mistral wind really helping that out. Here you find these sandy soils and those cobblestones that we've seen so, so much before. These this limestone rich soils here um, with lots of acidity to them. Um, so, you know, you barely, very rarely get any cloud cover in Lodan. It's always sunny, lots of direct sunshine because of the wind. It really blows any kind of cloud cover away too. So, you know, the, the temperatures here, neither too cool or too hot. Lots of sunshine is what you can expect. And who knows, maybe we'll see this as a future cru. I know a lot of the producers are hoping that will be the case um, in the near future. Um, so, as I mentioned, this was recognized officially a little bit later here in 1967, and it did change names. We're going to see that in a moment here. But there, you know, it's it's slightly smaller here. There are 24 wineries located in the Lodar, and I think maybe at a tasting, I met 20 out of 24 of them. Very, very friendly. Um, the soils here, as I mentioned, are, are often sa sandy, but also limestone rich, and they make these very perfect perfume, very aromatic reds, but the whites are, are quite distinctive. Um, Claret here is quite widespread, you know, one of my favorite white varieties that I alluded to in the Rhone here, quite widespread here. So we get about 78% red produced in Lodin, which is still pretty significant, but also that huge bump from 22% um, white. So in terms of how much white it makes, it makes up over 40% of the production of white wine in Côte du Rhône Village, AOC. I did not know that. So quite significant. Now, in terms of the flavors that you can expect here, because they're dominated by clarets with, you know, smatterings of Grenache Blanc, Roussin, and Bourboulon, which is one of my favorite varieties to say. And when you hear it said in kind of an accent du midi, it's even more musical and beautiful. But you get these, you know, fresh, um, fresh acidity, delicate floral aromas, but it's very vintage dependent. Very little rosé produced here, almost insignificant, but, um, you know, the strawberry flavors from, from Grenache really reign true. But the reds, which we're going to be focusing on in just a minute, dominated by Grenache and Syrah, as you would expect, give you um, a lot of this sweet red licorice fruit to it. So quite charming aromatically. So finally, let's get to our wine number six. We're already at wine number six. I think we're making some good time here. I'm going to pour some in my glass. This is the Maison Sinai 
élément. Um, this is the Luna Côte du Rhône village, Lodin Rouge. That's a big mouthful. Um, so, um, you know, this was formally made by um, the group known as Lodin Chusclan Vigneron. So the, the two um, adjacent villages. And the company really has um, been aggressively converting from bulk wine into bottle sales um, in, in really increasing volume. So, you know, a lot of its wines are now bottled as opposed to, to bulk production. And with that comes a significant rise, I think, in quality. Um, so these these vines here are grown on that galet roulé, which is so famous, and I don't even think I've said galet roulé once here, um, but these are the pebbles that were made smooth and round by the Rhone River, which has changed it, its course quite significantly um, over, over the centuries, and this is why you can see, um, you, you can see or feel these galet roulé significantly far from the Rhone uh, River itself, and they really um, have quite an effect on the ripening of the varieties as well as, of course, the drainage um, here. So I mentioned that this is known as Comte de César here. And so sometimes you see that reference on wine labels in, in the region. And um, we mentioned its elevation. And this is actually a 660 foot limestone plateau uh, behind the village of Laudan, which is where a lot of the grapes are grown. And this is where are the grapes for this particular wine were sourced. So some pretty nutrient deficient soils giving a lot of concentration to the fruit here and I think that's quite noticeable. So we've got a really Grenache I think dominant nose with a bit of that spicy Syrah chiming in here on the palate and you've got the influence of the darkness of Mourvedre which um, I think both in, in color, you can see is a little bit deeper in color than some of um, a lot of the, the Côte du Rhône villages that you might have, have seen before. And it does have that just slight amount of bitterness that helps really add freshness to the wine. And this is so important, I think, Evan, in warmer vintages too, mm -hmm. um, throughout the, the Southern Rhône, is that just, you know, it's not a very, very bitter uh, character, but just a slight bitterness that elevates the wine and gives it a little bit more freshness or perceived freshness on the palate. Yeah, so point, point well taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you know, this is this is a cooperative um, wine wine here, but I think it shows some of the quality that you're starting to see in co-ops that are transitioning from a lot of bulk production to bottle. Yeah, I, I have to say sheepishly and with some embarrassment that, that you know, when the wine was chosen, we put it together, I was, I was frankly, you know, relatively, dare I say, unaware. And, and, and then, of course, you see that they oversee, you know, 6,900 acres and makes them one of the largest uh, landholders on, on, on that right bank of the Rhone. And uh, um, but but nevertheless, interesting. But it's, it, 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 it's, it's for me. And, and frankly, I, I must say that maybe I I go with the sheep on this one. I'm actually more familiar with the whites, even though to your point, the reds make more. And, and I'm, I'm um, again, going in with eyes wide open and all that. I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. There's a seriousness about the wine. I mean, even both for the whites and for the reds, I, um, I understand your, your point about people thinking about lobbying to become a crew because it definitely has a point of difference. There's a distinctive um, element. There's a there's a there's a place that would be interesting. I wish I had been with you when we go through 20 different producers and meeting them all because I'm sure it would be a um, eye opening experience to really get a flavor and a sense of the place by going through it. And um, yeah, opulent with that Grenache Noir, but beautiful scaffolding with everything else. So thank you for that, Sarah. And with that. I'm going to bring us to um, not an official close, but a, uh, moving into a Q&A kind of close. And um, first and foremost, before the formal thank yous come later, um, before we hop into our happy half hour, um, big thanks to you, Sarah, and as well as to all the vintners for uh, bringing this uh, presentation to life. Um, I'm going to ask um, Li Meng uh, to join us here and help us moderate through any questions uh, that might um, exist out there. And um, then we'll slowly bring it to a close and join the happy half hour. We and then I think it might be a good idea to just have uh, to 
to do your last slide and we'll do the Q and A just because um, okay. there's a discussion um, that was put out. So okay, we'll do that. all right, let's do that. Well then let me do my merci bien it's really quick. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, uh, to all our speakers, um, to our various panelists, um, to Daphne and Eileen and the team at Enteron, uh, to Enteron itself and all the folks in Avignon and the Côte d'Iron, we are grateful for your support, participation and enthusiasm. Uh, to all of you out there in Zoom land, our delegates, please remember to submit your um, survey evaluations ASAP. Obviously it's important detail for us to continue to provide feedback, learn from it as well as um, continue to, to move on. And with that, I'm gonna do the um, simulcast, I guess, Li Meng, of connecting to the happy hour, happy half hour breakout while taking Q&A, stopping sharing my screen and all that other